Well, good morning. It's good to see you here today. My name is Rich Doring. I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here at Real Life. Again, uh, just like Pastor Ben said, we're thrilled to have you uh, with us today. This is kind of the end. This is the culmination of a number of weeks that we began in January on the Lord's Prayer. We're ending that today. The words of the Lord's Prayer are very specific. Uh, the very first phrase starts, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. But then you rec- recognize, really, that's the prayer. The prayer is that we would hallow God's name, that we would honor God's name, that God's name would be revered and held up, and that uh, the way we live our lives would honor him, hallow his name. So you begin to quickly realize the rest of the prayer is us living out a little bit of the answer to how God's name is hallowed. It says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's name is honored. God's name is hallowed as the realities of the kingdom of heaven become seen through his body on earth. His kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Also, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. Uh, We looked at those last Sunday and then this last Wednesday night in our Ash Wednesday service. We looked at what it looked like to honor God by trusting him for provision each and every day, not relying on ourselves. But then also this last Wednesday night, the Ash Wednesday service, talking about the fact that we have a God of forgiveness, and it honors God when we receive the forgiveness he gives us, but it also honors him and hallows his name when we forgive one another, and we're invited into that. And so today we're finishing the series with that last line, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So my wife and I, she's working in the kids department this morning, uh, so I can say anything I want. No, I'm just kidding. That was a dangerous statement, wasn't it? Um, My wife and I have three boys, and uh, this year in 2024, they'll be 23, 21, and 20. When we were doing this, we were like, boom, boom, boom. So these three boys, we've, we've kind of emerged, I think, out of a big chunk of our parenting responsibilities. And I know if you have older children, you're looking at me thinking, they come back home. Our goal is that they don't, uh, they might. Um, Your parenting is never over, you're always a parent, I get that. But we've kind of been through the whole raising up kids business. And uh, it was really interesting because Shelly and I have different backgrounds. Shelly came from a very uh, spiritual family, a very religious family, she was a pastor's kid. I did not, I mean, I grew up in the Catholic Church, but ultimately we were, we were kind of Catholic by heritage, not necessarily by faith. We were Dorings, but we were Catholic. Um, but all that to say, I didn't grow up like in a praying home. Um, I didn't know what it meant for my parents to pray for me. Uh, I didn't know what it meant to be uh, a family that even prayed around a dinner table. I am sure, I'm absolutely 100% convinced that there were times when I was in high school where my parents turned into praying people Uh, because of some of my behavior and some of the things I did in my life. But uh, all of that to say, when we were raising our boys, we were really intentional. We wanted to pray with our boys. We would pray with our boys. Sometimes we'd get them together before we all went to school and went our different directions. We'd pray in the morning before we all left the house. Uh, We've always prayed around meals. We've prayed with them before bed, uh, all kinds of different stuff. And we pray for our boys all the time, Shelly and I do. Um, We pray for their future spouses if that's God's will for them. Uh, We pray for their education. We pray for, obviously, their spiritual life and their connection to their Father in heaven. And uh, those those are really important to us. We pray all kinds of prayers, but I will be honest, the prayer that we've probably prayed more for our children these 23 years that we've been parents is prayers of protection. Prayers of protection. Now, A lot of times those prayers of protection usually coincided with a lot of firsts in life, okay? So the first sleepover at somebody's house, if you've ever gone through that as a parent, you're like, man, our world is perfect, nobody else's is. And you're about to throw that kid into somebody else's imperfect world, right? So protect my kid, protect my kid, right? Uh, We we pray as they get older, uh, even more prayers of desperation. For instance, the first date, when they go on their first date, I, Shelly prayed for that more than I did because we'll be the woman who takes her sons away from her. Uh, but, uh, but protect them, protect their hearts, right? Nobody wants to see their kid heartbroken 
And then the day, this is mine, where they take off in the car for the first time by themselves. And you're literally standing there. And honestly, if Jack, Jack is the oldest, when he was driving off, I'm gonna take mom's car and I'm gonna go to the Piggly Wiggly and I'm gonna go do this and go do that. And I'm watching and arguing with Shelly. He can't do that yet. Yes, he can, he can do that, he can, he's allowed. He goes with my wife's car. And honestly, it has nothing to do with Jack. I'm standing there thinking, oh my word, I was an absolute idiot when I was his age. And the things that my parents don't know about what I did with their car. And I'm just thinking, if there's a dumb, dumb gene, maybe it skips a generation. Because I had the dumb, dumb gene. If you want to know what the dumb, dumb gene looks like, it's me, okay? I did the dumb, dumb stuff. Thankfully, my boys have been, have been really good. I don't even think any of them even had a ticket. So, of course, they'll get one this week now. So... But what kind of prayers are these, right? They're, they're prayers of protection. They're prayers that please protect the people I care about, protect the people I love. We pray for protection a lot, I think. In fact, there's a prayer that we teach all children. We taught this to our children just because it's easy to remember. And I bet with me just saying the first two words, you can finish the prayer. So that's a hint for don't leave me hanging, okay? So here's the prayer, you ready? Now I Whoa, 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 hang on. We're teaching little children to pray if I should die before I wake up. Oh my word, that kid's not going to sleep. Are you surprised? <laughs> I can't sleep. You just told them they're going to die. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Good grief. <laughs> but ultimately what that prayer is, it's a prayer that says, man, anything could happen. Right? Anything can happen. It's a reminder that there's just so much that we're not in control of. Now, it's one thing to be frightened about what might happen as a child when you're sleeping and all that stuff, but I'm almost 50. I've got my big boy pants on now. And uh, I've been a big boy for a little while, but unfortunately what that means is we're just now more painfully aware of the things that could go wrong. How many of you wish, man, I wish I could go back and claim the innocence of eight years old? The things I did not know back then. But see, now big boys and big girls know a lot of things. We know there's a lot of pain. We're far too aware of how dangerous and painful life can be, which is why I think we spend a lot of time praying for protection, praying for protection. In this series, what we've really kind of seen is this. Jesus didn't just give us this to be a model for us to pray. It is. It's a model of prayer, but really, it's, it's also a model for how to live, how to live our lives so that we might hallow God's name. And when it comes to this idea of temptation, and protection and evil. If we are followers of Jesus Christ, it means that we, you and I, we profess a faith in Jesus. We are active participants in the rescue and the protection of ourselves and others. The question is, will we run to him? Will we run to him in our temptations? Will we run to him in the face of evil when we're confronted with those things? Will we turn to him. And Jesus begins this whole thing, and I think these might be the most two important words in this whole phrase, lead us. We begin this statement by praying to him, lead us, lead us. Now Jesus was well aware of the world that the disciples, his 12 that were around him were living in. Uh, he was gonna be crucified, he was gonna die, uh, he was going to be buried. He was going to raise again. But then after that, he would reappear, and then he would ascend into heaven one final time, and then he would tell his disciples. He would give them a commission. He would say, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'll be with you always. In fact, I'm going to send my spirit to live in you, God, in you, living through you. 
to impact the world so that his kingdom might come and his will might be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's about to commission them. And he knows full well the world that he's about to unleash them into. He knows the pain that the disciples are going to suffer. He knows the imprisonment that's going to come their way. He knows the beating. He knows the slander. He knows that every single one of these men, with the exception of one, is going to be murdered for their faith. He knows this. So he knows full well the brokenness of the world that he's letting them into. And he knows full well about the brokenness in our world, too. It's a fallen world. There's darkness around us. There is sin around us where broken human beings do broken things to broken people. If your, if your life was a book and it had all these pages and you were going through that book, going through that book, going th- there's got to be at least probably one or two pages in that book. For every one of us, this is where broken people did some broken things to me. We all have those experiences. We all do. There's a million ways to get hurt in this world, physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. What if that cancer comes back? I've done it twice. I don't want to do it a third time. What if it comes back? What if, what if my kid makes a wrong choice? First of all, newsflash, they will, because you did. What if they make a wrong choice? What if my parents break up? What if, what if this? What if that? What if? All these what ifs. If we're honest, I don't think it's, I want you to make sure you understand, I don't play the fear game. Uh, we're told to fear not quite a bit in scripture from Jesus himself. And uh, politicians play fear. <laughs> we don't, we're the church. But at the end of the day, there are a lot of things that happen in our world that would lead us to believe that there's no lack of tragedy. Right? There's, there's no lack of things we can point our finger at and say, that's brokenness, and I, I don't want to experience that. That's pain, and, and I don't want to experience that. Just think about the terminology that has emerged and become like second nature to us just within the last 20 years, maybe 25 years. Mass shooting. I didn't grow up hearing those words. Most of you didn't grow up hearing those words either. Human trafficking. My wife, on an annual basis, at Portage High School is trained how to identify students who are being trafficked in this community. Brokenness, pain, suffering. Or places, places that we never, knew, we never knew these places existed until we didn't know they existed. Sandy Hook, Parkland, Pulse Nightclub. We didn't know those places existed until we did, and we did for a reason. Or how about the word, and, and I'm sure, I don't know about you, I got tired of this back in 2020. If there was a perfect storm, <laughs> 2020 was a perfect storm, wasn't it? You got election stuff going on, you got COVID stuff going on, you've got racial stuff going on. You get, it's like the trifecta. And all you kept hearing over and over were, was one word unprecedented. You may remember how much that word was. This is, this is unprecedented. This political season is unprecedented. This, this health crisis is unprecedented. These racial tensions are unprecedented. It's all unprecedented. I'm like, press a, something else. I don't know. Don't precedent this anymore. We're done with the word. Okay? There's plenty of reasons to be anxious. There's plenty of reasons. We don't fear, but there's plenty of reasons to fear if that was our go-to. If that was our default. This is the world that Jesus is sending us into. This is a world that we are a part of. You and I do not get to escape the world that we live in. We're not called to escape the world that we live in. His followers are called into it, and as he calls us, his instructions to us begin with, lead us. That's how he says. He says, if you're going to live in this world, this is how it begins, lead us. Lead us. Now, that's not the usual word for lead that he's using right there. That's, you know, we, have, we have this idea of leadership as 
you know, I direct the troops, I lead, I, I sound the charge, I go in front. The moniker leader is given to just about anybody right now who has a platform or has anybody following them. Okay, but just having a platform, having a nice little iPad sitting on a round table up here does not make me a leader. Okay, just because I'm online right now, that does not make me a leader. Definitely not the leader that Jesus is speaking to. The word Jesus is, uses here means to bring, to carry. It almost implies this idea that I am over you, but I'm also with you, and I'm carrying you. I'm leading with you. It sounds more like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Makes me to lie down in green pastures. Leads me beside the still waters. He leads, carries, brings me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You're with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I like that. I like being led like that. What that tells is that Jesus isn't just telling me what to do. He's going with me where he wants me to go. He's with me. He's over me, but he's with me. He's like a shepherd, a good shepherd. I wonder if you might be like me. I don't know if this is a generational thing for me. I just, I'm just really uninterested <laughs> in following people who like to tell me what I should do. I don't know about you, but when somebody says, hey, Rich, here's what you need to do. I'm like, well, here's what you need to do right now. <laughs> I'm not interested in following leaders like that. Instead, I follow people who say, come with me. Come with me. The leading that Jesus defines is a shepherd walking with the flock as they make their way through the valley of shadow, through it. So why is that important? Because the Lord's Prayer does not say, keep us from temptation and evil. It's not what that, that's not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, keep us from temptation and evil. It implies that they're there already. There is, if you don't get tempted by anything, man, like, rub up on me or something, okay? I don't know who you are, but wear a flag or something, wave a banner. Temptation is there. Evil is there. That's why the prayer is lead us. It's bring us through. Show us the way. I want you to think of it like this. So back in, uh, I think that's 2017, we went on a vacation, went to go see my sister, and her husband's a park ranger in the Smoky Mountains. They live on the other side of the Smoky Mountains in South Carolina from Gatlinburg, Tennessee. So we were down there having a vacation, and we were like, you know, we're down here. We might as well go whitewater rafting. So who you see up there, I don't know who the guy in the blue is over there, just some random dude who jumped on our boat. But uh, right up there's front is Bryson, and then there's Cole, for some reason, found the one camera in the woods up on a hill and looked at it. I'm there with a grimace on my face and a camera on my head. Shelly's behind me, and then there's Jack with a strained look on his face. <laughs> and then the guy in the back, the guy in the back with the black helmet and the sunglasses, that's the guide, right? That's the white water rafting guide. And he's a really important dude in that boat. Before we ever even got in the boat, he said, if you do not plan on listening to me, you need to get out of the boat. And then once you get in the boat and you're on the river, do not get out of the boat. Do not jump out of the boat. Hang on to the boat. Do not lean over the edge of the boat. Do not do this. When I say paddle on the right, you paddle on the right. If you're on the left, you have nothing to paddle in that moment. Do not stick your paddle in. He's telling you all the things that you need to do to keep yourself safe, but then to also enjoy. And he says, every once in a while, you might hear me get real freaked out. You just listen. 
You just listen to exactly everything I say and do exactly as I tell you to do. And by the end of this, you'll want to do it again. You'll want to do it again. I didn't want to do it in the first place. <laughs> it was way too expensive and I'm super cheap, okay? <laughs> I didn't want to do it in the first place but I, because I'm trying to be a good dad and, and a good husband and not always the... There's a phrase I use, poop on the parade. I don't always want to poop on everybody's parade. I wasn't going to poop on this one. And so I just really wanted to be a good guy. So we all jump in the boat. We're all doing what we need to do. And so here's the deal. Here's the deal. That guy did not get in that boat and go, water, be still. And we just kind of moseyed our way down the river for a couple hours and got out. He didn't do that. He also didn't stand on the bank yelling, hey, ding-dongs. This is where you're supposed to paddle right. This is, get back in the boat. Don't jump out. Don't jump out. Put your jacket back on. He didn't stand on the shore doing all that stuff. Where is he? He's in the boat. He's in the boat. Jesus, is, is, he's in the situation with you. And that may be the thing you just need to hear today. I don't know. Whatever it is that you're facing, whatever temptation that you feel like is so overpowering to you, Jesus isn't standing off on the side somewhere, yelling at you saying, don't look, don't touch, don't taste. And he's like literally right there with you. Whatever thing you're questioning right now, whatever doubt that you have, whatever pain that you're going through, whatever, whatever dark tunnel you're in and you do not know if there's light on the other side of that, you need to understand Jesus isn't outside that tunnel. He's in it with you. So when you're praying, lead me not into temptation, lead me away from evil, it's not like Jesus is some ethereal figure somewhere else. He's with you. He's given you his spirit. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit at work in your life, God in you 24-7, working in you and through you. He's with you in the boat. He's with you in the boat. It's lead us not into temptation. Now, this is confusing terminology because generally speaking, a lot of times when things get translated into English, it doesn't go well. This is Greek. And so it sounds funny. It almost is like the guy in the boat, right, is saying, or you're praying to the guy in the boat, the guy in the boat, hey, don't take us and point us at the rocks. Little counterproductive, right? Of course the guy who's the guide is not going to point us at the rocks. So it sounds funny to say, you know, God, lead us. Not into temptation. Don't take us into the rocks. Don't make us crash. It's a no-brainer. So why would God do anything other than lead us away from temptation? Of course he is. James 1.13 says, When tempted, nobody should say, God's tempting me, for God can't be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. God doesn't tempt you. He's not tempting you. He never solicits us into evil. He never presents us an opportunity and say, this is a bad idea. You should take it because it looks so good. That's not God. God is not saying that to you. I want you to think of temptation kind of as a test, right? So let's say that I'm on a diet. Somebody chuckled. I heard it. <laughs> let's say that I'm on a diet, okay? And let's say that uh, you pick me up one day, we're going to go somewhere, and you're driving along, and uh, all of a sudden, you remember that even though it's only halfway through February, Dairy Dip is open. Because God has favor on the people of Portage. That's why Dairy Dip is open in February. So we start driving by Dairy Dip, and you slow down. And you slow down and you point it out. Hey, Rich, Dairy Dip's open. Like, I know Dairy Dip's open. Why are we slowing down? And you're in the driver's seat and you're saying, because Reese's Hurricanes taste good. <laughs> and chocolate malts taste good. And chocolate-covered bananas in ice cream with chocolate sprinkles, they taste good. Okay, so here's the deal. God doesn't do that to you. <laughs> you might do that. God does not do that to you. Here's the problem, though. There are a million dairy dips in this world. I go to Meijer and do grocery shopping. At the self-checkout, there's Swiss cake rolls individually wrapped for my selection and pleasure 
all the way down that little row before you get to the self-checkouts. And there's Dairy Queen. If Dairy Dip's not open, there's Dairy Queen. The problem is, is there's temptation everywhere. It's all over the place. Plus, just when you think, well, it is the middle of Christmas or middle of winter, and eating ice cream is weird in the middle of winter, uh, there's Girl Scout cookies. So it's Girl Scout cookie season. So again, it's just, it's one thing after another, after another. It means that when we pray this prayer, lead us not into temptation, we're asking God to lead us through life in such a way that the tests don't undermine our faith. Instead, he sees us through those things. He allows us to resist those temptations. He gives us the strength and the power to resist those temptations. And on the other side of it, guess what? Your faith grows. You become stronger. It becomes more possible to resist that temptation in the future. There's countless things in my life that I have struggled with. But when I've finally gotten victory over not giving into those temptations, it's amazing how those things have zero hold on me today. Zero hold. Because I've learned the fruit, the, the joy and the peace and the happiness and the contentment in my heart that comes from Jesus Christ after allowing him to lead me not into temptation. He's leading me and directing me as I encounter it. We're praying when temptation comes, I am asking you to lead me in such a way that I can withstand the temptation and not give in. And I can promise you today, Jesus has the power to do that. He has the power to do that for you. Now, there's a condition, and I use that word carefully. If you ask somebody to lead you, you're kind of implying you're going to follow, right? So when he does lead you, your part is allowing yourself to deny yourself and follow where he leads and how he leads, how he leads. The context of this prayer, we hallow God's name when we follow his lead in our lives, turning to God when temptation comes and asking him for the strength to drive right past, to close that mouth, to look the other way, to stand up when other people won't stand up for others, all of those things. And, and then we ask him to deliver us from evil. This prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, is not an escape from the realities of living in a broken world. It's the world we live in. This isn't, isn't just about physical safety. This is about spiritual safety. It's about you being protected spiritually. There is a reality of evil at work in this world. It's a fact. Working to prohibit people like you and I and those that don't know Jesus yet to experience the love and the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness and the freedom of Jesus. That's the goal, that you and I might experience bondage and not freedom. So Jesus himself had to pray for protection for his disciples. It only makes sense that we need to pray for ourselves. John 17, 15, Jesus prays this for them. He says, my prayer is not that you take them out of this world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Jesus knew, he knew what his disciples were gonna face. He knew the opportunities that would present themselves to his disciples to forsake him for their own safety, for their own self. He knew all of those things. He knew they'd be harassed, thrown in jail, put to death. So he prayed that their faith would not fail but stand. He prayed for their protection, spiritual protection, deliverance from evil, so just like temptation, you and I do not need to look very far to find evil. In fact, most of us carry it in our pocket 24-7 at our fingertips. You can find it if you're looking. I wonder, though, though, how many times we forget that the battle that we have is a spiritual one. Ephesians 6, when the Apostle Paul, he's challenging believers put on the armor of God, he says in verse 6, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. But I can tell you this, by virtue of the very fact that Jesus Christ was buried and rose again and beat death, 
tells me that we know somebody who has the power to withstand all of it. He has the power to withstand all of it. To pray, deliver us from evil is to pray, deliver us from the root of it. Deliver us from sin. Man, that should be our first prayer. Deliver us from sin. The wages of sin is death. Jesus beat death. The more we entertain sin, the more we entertain death. Brokenness, pain, suffering, all of it, mourning, crying, tears, all of it. We need to pray that God would deliver us from the root of evil, which is sin. Deliver us from the product of sin. Death. There's a morning, we're pushing close to 25 years ago, there was a woman named Lisa Jefferson. She was working as a supervisor at the Verizon Air Phone Call Center. She started talking to a passenger on United Airlines Flight 93. He said, I'm Todd Beamer from Cranberry, New Jersey. Three people have hijacked the plane. Two have taken over the cockpit. If I don't get out of this, will you tell my wife and family that I love them? So then Todd asked her, would you say the Lord's Prayer with me? And so slowly, phrase by phrase, he and this woman that he'd never met prayed the Lord's Prayer together. And after that, he said, a few of us are going to jump these guys. And we all probably know the end of that story. That flight crashed into a field killing everybody on board, but probably sparing hundreds of more lives as it was headed to Washington, D.C. Um, James 1.12 says this, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When this man, Todd Beamer, found himself facing this trial, what did he do? Let's pray. He prayed first. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hallowed be your name. Thank you for providing for me every day. Forgive me. Help me to forgive others. But lead me. Lead me. Now, you might be thinking, man, I'd like to think if I was ever in that situation, that's me, man. I'm going to pray and then get to action. Most of us are never going to face a situation on that scale. You get that, right? We all face micro versions of it every single day, though. Every day. The Todd Beamers default to prayer in the big situations because they default to prayer in the little ones. Every single day. They're looking for God's leadership in their life. Every single day. In every area. This is the 21 days of prayer coming to a close. And and we need to remember that whatever may come, we have a prayer that invites God to bring us through trials. We have a prayer that invites God to lead us past and through temptations. It's right to pray for protection. You should be praying for protection. When we board a plane, when you walk out the door into the broken world, that doesn't mean tragedy won't come. You get that, right? Does not mean tragedy won't come, but that's why we ask God to lead us, to bring us through in a way that honors and blesses others and advances his kingdom. His kingdom. Speaking of which, you ever notice that sometimes when we pray the Lord's Prayer, there's another line at the end? Another line at the end. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You ever heard it, son? The glory forever. So that wasn't really added until after the second century, to the end of it. Uh, But I do think it is appropriate, and so I'm going to ask you to stand if you would. I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to close out this series by praying together. Uh, We've established a prayer room in this church, and I just would encourage anybody to utilize it. There's information about when it'll be open. And then, of course, we gather at 9 o'clock every Sunday to pray for the services and pray for each other. I want to invite you. 
the 21 days of prayer is just a catalyst. That's all it is. We continue this action of prayer as we move forward. But would you pray what you see on the screen there with me, the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Father, thank you. Your grace is sufficient. You've told us that in your word. And Father, as we pray that last phrase, lead us. Lead us. It means that we are submitting ourselves to follow. So Father, when temptation comes, when we see evil before us, we have prayed that you would lead us. Lead us through those things. Lead us around those things. Lead us past those things, and in doing so, help our faith to grow and strengthen as your people. Father, protect us. I pray that you just protect every single person in this room, everybody that's watching this online, somebody five years down the road who's going to stumble across this video and watch it. I pray that you would protect them too. There's so much in this world that is designed to steal the peace that we can have in knowing you. So right now, Father, we cast that away. It does not belong here. It does not belong with these people. It does not belong on these people. But today, Father, we do claim the name of Jesus because in the name of Jesus, our faith is perfected. In the name of Jesus, we find ourselves free from the bondage of sin. In the name of Jesus, we find ourselves cleansed. We find a Savior who is leading us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though we might walk through things like the valley of the shadow of death, situations, Father, that we can't even predict remotely how they might end up, we know that you're in the boat with us. You're not standing at the shore. You're not off in some distant place. You promised that you would be with us just like you promised the disciples that you would be with us to the very end of the age. You are with us today. And so, Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you for the privilege it is to be in real life. We love you. It's in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Thank you for being here today. Enjoy the sun.